One thing that I would say is that, you know, it comes almost in the space between empathy and maybe uh, inspiration is that oftentimes, like, you know, you listen to sounds and you listen to different organisms and you're really at awe of this orchestra of things that these animals are able to do. Like, you know, bowhead whales, you know, singing through under the ice and in, in the Arctic and creating these complex songs and singing for, you know, many, many minutes at a time. Um, you know, this time of the year, you know, we are going through some migration of warblers and these tiny little warblers the size of your thumb creates these complex songs and projects it with all of his heart uh, or her heart. <laughs> And, and, and to create, send a message and for us to kind of first experience that and then get inspired to understand that. I think that creates that connection and kind of gets to that space of empathy, but that's more of a human experience to empathy towards the singers of the biological world within our interspecies, if that empathy exists in the acoustic space, that's a fascinating question and I don't have answer or insight into that. For me as a fish biologist, when I tell people I study fish acoustic communication and fish singing at each other, I often get a lot of really weird looks where it's like, what fish do that? Uh, you know, people fully appreciate it for birds singing and whales singing uh, and other other critters in nature. But I think when people, you know, non-scientists start to find out that you know, all these animals are using sounds to communicate, I think that gives people a broader appreciation for what animals are capable of. Um, you know, and to not, you know, I don't, I don't like to, for me personally, don't like to say that one animal is smarter than another. You know, these are animals that evolved over hundreds of millions of years to do what they do. And the fact that they still exist means they're, they're good enough at it. Um, you know, so I, but I do think that when you start to share with people how this diversity of, of, of animals are using sounds to communicate, I do think it imparts significant appreciation on, on the part of the public to, to realize these are more than just a sack of cells uh, existing in nature, that there's something more to it. You know, there, there, there can, in some cases, be relatively sophisticated information encoded in sounds that are being transmitted between sender and receiver. And so the dynamics of you know, a, a speaker, so to speak, or a singer and a listener um, is this uh, dyadic relationship that we see really at all uh, levels of life. part or you know kind of moving forward into their kind of the life trajectory by using you know sound and using their environment you know we see many many examples of how some of the species are kind of the masters of their own ecosystems and habitats and domains you know a, a blue whale kind of almost uses the physics of the ocean to send a message that that can travel hundreds of miles, if not more, and uh, evolution, and then adaptation to that evolutionary process and understanding what's going on, that's probably guiding them to be able to orchestrate that long-term, long-distance communication processes. Even you know, birds and other animals, you know, they are using. Uh, their habitats, even this type of canopy, or what level of the of the forest that they reside in, and what type of vocalization that they produce, and how far they project, all of those information is really really intricate, and is in many ways very smartly designed. Um, another thing happens is you know how the physical side of it, and also acoustic communication side of it, they are trying to project information to to the receiver that they want to receive, but also evading danger, you know, 
So my mate can hear me, but the predator shouldn't. So creating this kind of the, these channels, and oftentimes there's a talk about you know acoustic niche, which is as some species occupy a certain part of this time frequency domain of sound versus acoustic partitioning, and all these type of intricate things that more we look, the more we find, and they are masters of their their environment, and they're using sound to drive some of the functions that are mentioned to further their own well-being and uh, their life cycle. Well-being may not maybe a more anthropomorphized term, but you know, success towards their species um, end goal. We see incredible examples of that all over, but more is, is needed to understand because, you know, again, these are, especially from the acoustic point of view, it's a pretty quickly evolving science. And the more we look, the more new information that we find. So I think one of the one of the phenomena that you see both sociologically humans as well as you know in some ecosystems is you know almost homogenization uh, occurring at large scales. Like so, you know, I have family from the deep south, you know, and you know really strong southern drawl that you used to hear. That for me, I hear and I I immediately envision my grandparents, you know, sitting on the porch. And now you go down to a place like Georgia, you know. So many of these these mannerisms and way of speaking are disappearing. As we as there's more and more mixing between different subpopulations, a lot of those nuances to you know to speech and to ways of speaking are disappearing. I think in parallel with that is that with losses of biodiversity, these soundscapes that we listen to, that we you know grow to understand nature, are also changing. So you know think about you know with let's say the loss of wolves in the in the mountain west you know the the howls that you might hear at night are, are disappearing um you know that you have some of these acoustic mimics things like you know i mentioned like uh, lyre birds that are able to repeat with astonishing clarity the the sounds of other species around them so what happens when those species go extinct you know do, do those aspects of their mimicry do those disappear as well or do they you know encapsulate soundscapes of eras gone by and does the does it persist i think what's what's so cool in thinking about this connection this deeply rooted connection between song or speech and cultural history is you know we see this in humpback whales where song is culturally transmitted you know they we're still trying to figure out what exactly it means with these really complex and elaborate acoustic displays but what we know is that somewhere in the western pacific this structure of, of themes and notes emerges and it basically propagates across the the central pacific to the east and the indian ocean across to the west and it's changing over time these are these are learned songs that animals are doing uh and they're adapting and so we can see this process of cultural transmission occurring you know in these in these great whales and i think a, a really uh, captivating question is how widespread is the cultural transmission through speech or song across the animal kingdom? Certainly humans do it. The fact that uh, that whales are doing it uh, is really provocative. And, and then I think it, it raises the question of where else is it occurring?